nice to meet you. Um, I'm going to introduce myself briefly, and then I'll ask you to introduce yourself. My name is Michael Epstein. I am the director of a San Francisco-based studio called Walking Cinema. Um, why don't you introduce yourself in the museum? I'm Bruna Baffa. I'm the executive director here at the Museum of Tomorrow. Uh, the Museum of Tomorrow is a science museum. It is a museum that uses science as a way to provoke people to think about the desired tomorrows. Where do we want to go? So when we thought about the Museum of Tomorrow since the beginning, the museum is based here in Rio de Janeiro in a very important region of Rio uh, called Praça Mauá. Little Africa is a very uh, historic, with a lot of historic importance, region here in Rio de Janeiro. And we are situated in this area, in the central area of Rio. And when the museum was born, the idea was to build a space where we could think about humanity in an anthropological way, uh, open way, in a broad way, to think about the challenges that humanity faces today. So, therefore, we decided to build a museum that has two main ethical axes, sustainability and conviviality. The main challenge of the museum, basically, is to think how do we want to go to the future how can we build this future today, now? Today is the moment of action. So how do we want to do that in communion? How do we want to do that collectively? How do we want to do that with other people, with nature, with our planet? So therefore we have these two axes, there are sustainability and conviviality. So we work together and see this future as a collective uh, enterprise, as something that we do together. And I think the museum has a challenge of bringing sustainability, bringing science to the discussion in a country like Brazil. But also we know that we are an international museum. We receive a lot of visitors from outside of Rio de Janeiro, from outside of Brazil too. And we were one of the pioneers to think about, to have this idea of future-oriented museums. So we even have a network today uh, of other museums around the world that discuss this idea of future that discuss this idea of humanity, and we are part of this network proudly. And we think we have a lot of responsibility of thinking about this future from Brazil, from this region called Little Africa. Uh, it is a region that has its name because we have the Valongo Wharf nearby the museum. It was the biggest port of slaves in the world. So we are not just only a science museum, we're not just only a museum that talks about sustainability and conviviality and all this hum humanitarian and humanities access. We are a museum situated in Brazil that relates to a lot of this discussion in our uh, environment. We are surrounded by the Guanabara Bay, that is a very important natural uh, area of Rio de Janeiro too, with a huge ecosystem, natural ecosystem. So all of that speaks to the museum and the museum speaks about that as well in return. That's great. Well, tell me a little bit more about uh, this project that you made during COVID that won the LCD awards for best digital experience in museums. So one important thing about the museum is when the museum was inaugurated, we, we have this long-term exhibition that there was a challenge, right? What is a museum of tomorrow? What can we talk about in an exhibition that is going to last long and keep update, keep, how do I say that? How do we, how can we talk about this future, have an exhibition that is going to last long but not be outdated in a very short moment because the Museum of Tomorrow is, is it technological? Are we going to talk about the novelties in the world? So we decided to go to another way. We went millions of years before and we did an exhibition that goes from where we came from until where are we going to and how do we want to go there? This last question of the exhibition, it's like a music, uh, a, music a musical song or something like this. We end thinking about how do we want to go to our future. And this ending is something that guides us in everything that we do here in the museum. How do we want to go to the future that we see there is an opportunity to be there, that we envision, that we imagine together? And 
Everything we do in the museum always in presence or digitally is connected to that. In the pandemic, we knew, of course, everybody in the whole world suffered a very severe uh, crisis, political collapse, social collapse, economical collapse. Mm -hmm. So we were suffering a moment of uh, distance between people, not a lot of hope. And one of the key challenges of the museum was always to think about the future we want, giving hope to people, giving people the tools or the possible imaginations to create these futures together, to imagine how do we want to go there. So when we had the pandemic, we thought, okay, we're going to close the doors of the museum, a museum that receives a million people per year. So we, are we going to miss this opportunity to keep sending our message, to keep exchanging with people, and more importantly, to keep creating this future together? We cannot do that, of course. So we decided that uh, we wanted to do some encounters, some key encounters with people that knew a lot about science, that knew a lot about the environment, about sustainability, but also people that could give hope and inspire people around the world. So we brought here to the museum to these digital encounters in the YouTube of the museum, Gilberto Gil, that is a cultural icon, a singer, Sebastião Salgado, a super well-known photographer, Bruno Latour, philosopher. We also brought the astrophysicist uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So we brought many people that spoke to the things that the museum talked about, science, sustainability, conviviality, but also that people that could give hope and could send messages and say, look, we are here, we are together, we are in the same place, and we are imagining this future together, even if we are in different places, through a screen and, and with a bit more distance that we wanted. So this was a mission that the museum had, and we created this project throughout uh, the pandemic that was really nice. We were very happy. We had more than 5,000 people watching it, more than 140,000 impressions uh, in the videos. So it was something that also gave us the opportunity to understand that the museum, not only the Museum of Tomorrow, right, but every museum is a space of thinking, of exchange, that is not uh, confined to these walls, to the walls of the exhibition or to the building. It is an idea, it is something that should be spread in the world, that should have more discussion with people that cannot come here, but they can have the idea and exchange ideas about what we, sp we speak, about what we want to, to tell people in a distant way. So this was a, a project that we're very proud of because of that. Tell me a little bit more about the content. I understand that you had these people who are very recognized scientists, thinkers, cultural icons. What were they talking specifically about coronavirus? Were they talking openly about ideas? How did you figure out what they would say and how to connect all these different videos? I think in that period, it was difficult not to have someone talking about COVID, coronavirus. So of course, this was a topic. Uh, but one thing that we thought was very important was to bring their knowledge from different areas to inspire people, to remind people of beauties in life, the challenges in life, how we could have hope, how we could think about the world critically, of course, to understand that that moment that we were uh, living was not something that just happened. There were many things connected to that uh, situation. So we brought people from different knowledges to discuss this critically, but also to give us ideas and uh, sensations and feelings of hope about other subjects as well. So people singing or discussing physics or discussing science, discussing the environment, thinking about the ideas of not to be in another crisis like that in the future, how we could reflect on ourselves, reflect on the planet. So it was a space of thinking exchange and of collective um, imagination, I guess. We live in a time of enormous pessimism. I think uh, many people around the world feel a certain pessimism. And you talked about hope. How do you balance that, you know, providing hope to people, but also staying on your mission of basing it on science? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question because, of course, we know that we are in a moment of social collapse, of climate 
uh, crisis, an extreme and severe and very urgent climate crisis that we need to act now. But we also know that if people feel despair, it's hard for you to move, right? You lose hope, then you lose all your will to do something. And if you do something even in your community, in your life, it has, it, it brings change. So our mission here, I think that's why everything we do in the museum is to bring knowledge to understand what are the possible paths of science to live a different future in the next 50 years. So if you do it, something like this, if you change the way that you move in the cities or the way that you think about uh, mobility, the way that you think about the food systems or energy. So we bring some ideas for people to reflect on some things that they sometimes feel that's the way, how, that's the, way the world is. But we provoke them, we use science to provoke them to say, Maybe you can think it in another way. Maybe you can see things in another way. We're not going to do a harsh transition, but we're going to try. We can try some different ways of living and of seeing ourselves as humans in this planet. But most importantly, not only giving information. I think our main challenge here and the biggest space that we have to create hope is to build a community. And to bring people here in this square, in the center of Rio, in this museum that is a big museum with this beautiful Guanabara Bay around us, for people to think, I am in a safe space where I can imagine another world, where I can see people already living other alternatives, where I can see other thinkers, where I can mix scientific knowledge with other knowledges, knowledges from uh, indigenous people, uh, from people with African background that were very important for our ancestrality here in Brazil, of course, and in the whole world. How can we mix all this, mix these knowledges and understand sometimes that the future, the answers that we need are not going to come from AI necessarily. They're going to come from ancestral practices, some from other ways of living in community collectively that are answers to problems that we live right now of solitude, of scarcity, of feeling that there is no way of huge consumption. We can think of other ways of living, but we need to live with other people to be inspired by that. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I mean, you're saying the pessimism that people feel can maybe not go away completely, but have some balance with learning more about the science of what's happening and then the scientific possibilities for solutions so they don't just see things as going one direction. Is that right? Totally, yeah. totally. We, we have here, uh, we are a museum. There is a chair of UNESCO talking about futures literacy. So we have the, the challenge here in the next four years to decolonize the idea of future. That I was discussing with a friend the other day and uh, they were saying there is a, a history of the future. We live a future, a story, we tell a story about the future and then this future is materialized because we create the own idea of the future that we think of. Somehow we colonize our future because we think there's only a way and we think there's only one path. And in this path, we end up in the expected path from before. So our challenge here is also talking about tomorrow's, the Museum of Tomorrow, of course, is to decolonize this idea of future. How can you build other paths in front of you? How can you imagine the unimaginable? How can you look ahead and say, if I go like this, I will end up there. But maybe if I imagine something completely different, I can end up somewhere that I don't have any idea, but I'm going to do this exercise. We see this exercise happening a lot in science fiction, in literature, Afrofuturism, many other uh, practices, cultural practices, manifestations and expressions that are super relevant today. So we have this compromise of trying to decolonize this idea of what will necessarily happen. We want to bring people to experiment other possibilities, basically. Yeah, it's interesting what you're bringing up because I'm a media producer. So I think a lot about what the media landscape looks like. And over the last 10 years, Hollywood has put out more and more superhero films because they know they can sell them. There's an economic reason. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, we don't need escapism. We don't need to escape 
to these superpowers and, and other planets, you know, we need reality. But on the other hand, you sometimes get too much reality in documentaries. You know, you see documentaries that are really about how bad the world is or how much, how big a crisis is and the solutions seem missing. And so I feel like it, in my mind often shifts between how do we mix the two? How do we mix some idea of fantasy of what could be possible of our own power with reality and documentary? And it sounds like your museum is, is also trying to do the same thing. I think we are trying to do that collectively when we talk, when we see the rise and the empowering of many voices that were not traditionally uh, heard, but they were speaking, but, but were not heard. It is a change that we see that is very substantial. And sometimes we don't need to go, uh, when we talk about seeing other realities, you don't need to, to look at something fantastic on Mars or something like that. You can go to an indigenous community and you can see a very different way of living, of dealing with nature, of dealing with community, of dealing with each other, with food, with the respect to this otherness. That is, uh, there are animals, there are other people. Even we had here a program in the museum where someone uh, told us from one indigenous uh, tribe, they told us, we don't speak in singular, we speak only in plural. We are only plural. We are one people. There is not me only. I don't have the singular word for my, for my people. And this is something very interesting. This is something that is imagining something completely different. And you don't need to go to Mars to see that. You can go somewhere that is not the mainstream or the story that was always told and that we see is the only way of living. And right. I think we need to hear more of these stories. Let's switch a little bit to how you told the stories. You chose to do a VR project and 2D film. Tell me um, about that choice and how do these two media projects complement each other? We actually, we, actually, we actually focused on the 2D film. So we did this Tomorrow's Here and Now. We always do a lot of VR projects here in the museum, but in this uh, situation specifically, we focused on these videos that are mm -hmm. about these encounters and telling stories. The power of storytelling, the power of connecting to others, to telling a story and to hearing back and to have these conversations. It's not very innovative, but is something that comes to people's, that reaches people's hearts. And that way it becomes something different and becomes something powerful. Tell me more about how, you know, you worked with YouTube or, or, or leveraging video. I mean, I get an idea that you did these interviews, you put them up on your YouTube channel. Was there anything else you did to kind of frame the experience of the videos, materials that people could do or discussions that you monitored? Actually, we worked in a pretty simple way on YouTube, having the encounters and opening up the doors and the windows of the museum to, to other people. But of course, we use all the other social media to amplify the content. So, and, and we understood the power that we have to connect to people besides the physical space. So uh, we went to Google Ads and Culture, we went to Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn. So we connected to people and we told different stories, residual stories from the main story that was on YouTube. So it, it lasted longer because we could build more conversations around that central piece. So that kind of linking, you plant a seed, but then you also link to how the conversation yeah. grows. Um, great. Also, could you uh, speak a little bit about um, just the changes overall to the museum? A lot of people, you know, when COVID start talked about getting back to business as usual, returning to what was before, but it sounds in a way like your museum has embraced a new way of operating based on what you learned during COVID. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, we, in two ways, right? When we come to work here, we are working in a hybrid model. So everybody that works here, we come to the museum a lot because we are a physical space. So we need to be here. But also for visitors, we understood that there is not only one museum of tomorrow. And this in the communications team was very obvious. Uh, even before, I think, but after the pandemic and after this huge digital effort, it stayed uh, with us. 
So we do a lot of programs here, but we do live streaming of everything so people in other places can see that. We do all the translation, subtitles. We, we use the Brazilian language of science to be more accessible to, to people. So everything, when we do a transmission and when we bring content to people, we have this worry to be very accessible too. That is very important. So all the other channels and social media, we kept uh, working on the content. We kept uh, broadening the, the idea of what the programming of the museum was and expanding it and amplifying it digitally. I'm curious because, you know, I work in digital media that happens outside of the museum. And I'm wondering, you know, as the museum was closed for a while, if you thought about uh, that type of expansion to either activities or media experiences that happen in neighborhoods or outdoor spaces. During the pandemic, we did not do this kind of activities because things were were complicated. Today we see that we have this power of this meta narrative, even here in the museum, right? We have a project right now that we started in the beginning of the year. We want to amplify it. We have the museum and we have the surroundings of the museum. In the surroundings of the museum, we receive more than 5 million people every year because it's an open area, a very beautiful area. And we have this kind of visitor here that says, is a very special kind of visitor that says, have you been to the Museum of Tomorrow? And they answer, I have, but I have not been into the museum. I only stayed in the outside of the museum. But they feel that they were in the Museum of Tomorrow too. So with this insight, we thought, why don't we create a gallery, a new space around the museum so people could start thinking about our content, about sustainability science from outside. Something that is not invasive because we don't want to 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 spoil the, the environment or something like the, the view, but we are using QR codes and we have some uh, artwork from an artist, like there was a, a 3D artwork uh, that you could scan your cell phone on the QR code and then you could see this beautiful tree in front of the museum. So you see new landscapes around the museum mm -hmm. with only one sign and that inspires you to see more of what we want to talk about and maybe come inside or maybe not. Maybe you just keep a message, a short message and you bring home and have seen something different. Was there one video that really surprised you, you know, that maybe it was different than you thought it would be or it just impacted you in a way that kept you thinking um, about the project or the museum in a different way? I think I love this idea. It is amazing to have people from all over the world talking about uh, about their ideas of future. I really love Gilberto Gil. He's an icon. He's someone that is very inspiring for us here. So it is something that touches everybody's hearts to hear Gil talking about the world, talking about what he thinks about the world. So I'm very fond of him. A very fan of him, so it's it was very nice. I saw him. I guess he was the minister of culture for a while. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. We saw him maybe twenty years ago in Venice, Italy, and he did a really inspirational talk. Uh, and then he played music, and I love that how the two work together, his songs and his ideas. He's amazing. We are still living many legacies of Gilberto Gil in the Ministry of Culture until now. It's great. Uh, this has been wonderful, Bruno. It was great. Thank you for listening.